Today we're in Judges chapter 17. Judges chapter 17, we just finished up um, looking at the life of Samson, which is the first several chapters before this, and a very interesting story, a very interesting character, Um, and today we're going to look at chapter number 17, unusual story, unusual event that takes place. Um, You know, a lot of what happens in the book of Judges uh, are not a pattern for us on how we're to live our lives. They're certainly not an example to us of things that we should do. We do see the Lord's working in these things, but uh, most of the events that take place are God working in spite of how an individual is behaving themselves or how they're acting. Um, And one of the reasons that the Lord does this is because of a verse that we will come across in this chapter, Judges chapter number 17. In fact, we'll look at it. Verse number 6, Judges 17, 6 says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that seems to be really um, the theme for the book of Judges. Um, As God deals with Israel, And as God deals with what they get themselves into, you know, we've talked about this cycle that they're going through. They, they, you know, they're following God, but then as time goes on, they get away from the Lord. They become apathetic. They become, um, uh, they start to do evil before the days of, before the eyes of God. Uh, And then God judges them. But what he does is he, he lets them become servants to um, those inhabitants that are in the land that are the pagan you know, uh, people that are in the land there, they become servants to them, and what will happen eventually, they'll cry out to God because they'll find themselves enslaved or they'll find themselves being judged, and they will cry out to God, and God will hear their cry once again, and they will come back to the Lord. Um, But then with time, the same thing happens. They find themselves getting away from the Lord again, and we see this happening over and over. And so as we're going through the book of Judges, really it's like we're doing a study of, of individuals or judges that God uses to... Uh, to help Israel get out of the situation that they are in. And so we're following sort of the lives of these different men as we go through. We just looked at Samson. um, uh, uh, But then it sort of shifts gears a little bit. It's a little bit different as far as that goes as we look at chapter number 17. We're going to see a very interesting thing take place, a very interesting event take place here. And we're just going to get to chapter number 17, but this story will continue through the next couple of chapters, a few chapters um, uh, but we're going to look at a man by the name of Micah and something that he has done. Um, and now what's interesting about this is him and his mother seem to be, or well, very apparently, as we look at the chapter, uh, interested in getting God, Jehovah God, God's blessing on what they're doing, but they are not following God's instructions by any means. Um, and they're very mixed up. They're very confused on, uh, on what really is right and wrong. And so um, we'll look at that as we get into this chapter. And so let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into Judges chapter number 17. Let's, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your word. Today, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand your word. Sometimes these Old Testament passages of scripture, um, although it's a very interesting story, sometimes it it, we find it difficult to find practical application for ourselves in some of these things. But Lord, we understand that all your word is profitable and that you want to use your word today to speak to our hearts and lives. And as we consider this, this story that took place in chapter number 17 of Judges 17, I pray that you'd help us to understand the truth of your word and the end result, Lord, or the results of not being you know, uh, getting our instruction from your word and help us, Lord, to to understand the importance of knowing your word and and applying it to our lives. Thank you for what you've blessed us with. Be with the services today, Lord, the Sunday school classes. I pray all these things will be done to your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Judges chapter number 17, and uh, we'll look here, verse number 1 and 2 says, 
Uh, and there was a man of uh, Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. So we seem to be sort of coming in on something that has already taken place. We're sort of jumping into the story after some events have already happened. Apparently, there's 1,100 um, shekels of silver that this woman possessed or had, and then it went missing, and she's very upset about this. Um, and the Bible says she was even all upset and, and cursed or was mad about this and, and cursing it, that, that this happened, and, and told her son about it. And, and so at this point of the story, as we come into the narrative, he is now approaching his mother uh, and saying, you know, that silver that you were all upset about and seems to be missing, um, uh, that, uh, that 1,100 shekels of silver, um, I'm the one who took this, right? I took that silver from you. So the chapter opens with a man named Micah, and uh, he stole money from his mother, right? He stole this, this money from his mother, this 100 shekels of, uh, 1,100 shekels of silver, but, uh, but he comes to her and, and confesses the fact that he took it. By the end of verse number two, she says, Blessed be thou the Lord, my son. So um, why would he, she say that? Not because he stole the money, but because the intention here is that he's going to now bring it back to her. He's going to bring back this 1,100 shekels of silver that I should not have taken. And we'll see that in the next couple of uh, verses. He admits to the theft and returns the money to her. And we'll see that in just a moment. And the mother is blessed that, that his son has confessed to this and returned the money um, uh, um, to her. So we see really right off the bat... There's some sort of unusual strain here between mother and son. Um, at some point, he felt com comfortable enough to steal something from his mom. Now, whether he was convicted about it or whether, you know, what, the Bible doesn't really say why he confessed to this, but he brings the, the money back. And so he says, it says to her, I, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou uh, of the Lord, my son. Now, I want you to notice at the end of the verse, she said, Blessed be the of the Lord, capital L. She is referencing Jehovah God. She says, okay, this is the God of the Bible that we recognize, and we, um, you know, we understand that we, we worship God, uh, but they're very misguided, and we're going to see this as we get into the story. They're very misguided on what is right and wrong as far as worshiping and recognizing Jehovah God. So, Verse number three and four, and when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, so he, he confessed that he took it and he, and he gave it back to her. Right? And when he had done that, when he gave her back the silver, he, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated this silver, the silver, unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. So she said, all right, my intention from the beginning was to take this silver that I had and to give it to you. But I'm going to give it to you by way of making a, um, a you know, a graven image and, a, and a, a molten image. Verse number four, yet he restored the money unto his mother and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image and they were in the house of Micah. So she said, I'm going to make these images for you. The mother um, expressed that the money was always dedicated to the son and took the 200 shekels of silver. Now she only took 200 shekels of the 1,100 um, to make this. But she took 200 um, uh, shekels of silver and made it an image and made an image out of it. So here we have something that is clearly, clearly in violation to God's word. This is a direct violation to one of the Ten Commandments, as we see in Exodus, um, with Exodus 19. We see the, the Ten Commandments. And uh, let's take a look at it. I believe it's Exodus 19. Exodus, either 19 or 20. Exodus 20, I'm sorry, Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. Here we have in Exodus chapter 20, um, of course, the law of God can consist of over um, 600 different laws, I'm told. And so 
Um, they are all narrowed down to 10 commandments that are listed here in Exodus chapter number 20, um, sort of summarized here in 10 commandments uh, that we are to, that the children of Israel to are, were to be obedient to. And we see here in the first couple of commandments, verse number one says in Exodus 20, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the waters under the, uh, under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the four, third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, that's what he specifically says here, verse number four. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, when we see the children of Israel find themselves getting into serious trouble and God brings down great judgment on them, what do we see? We see the children of Israel making a, an image of some sort. Exodus chapter number 32 is when they, they make um, the, the golden calf that Aaron makes for the children of Israel while Moses is up in the mountain. Um, getting the uh, instruction from God. And so he comes down, and they've made a, a golden calf to worship. Um, a, and, a, and this golden calf is now something that they were propping up to be the God that led them out of Egypt. And by the way, they got this um, idea or practice from being in Egypt. Um, in first, I think it's First Kings chapter number 12 is when uh, the king, and boy, his name escapes me, is it Jeroboam? I think it is Jeroboam who sets up that, that golden image in Bethel because he doesn't want the children of Israel to worship in Jerusalem, um, at least that, that northern kingdom. He doesn't want them going back down to Jerusalem lest they you know, start worshiping um, the Lord properly. And so he sets up this, this false worship system, um, and he includes a golden calf just like they did in Exodus chapter 32. And so um, when the children of Israel get away from serving God, right, they set up these golden calves or these golden images, and that is a direct violation to what God told them to do. He told them not to do this. And so we see here, obviously, that Micah's mother in uh, uh, Judges chapter number 17 is doing something that is in direct violation to the word of God. So here, she, at least in her testimony of verse number three, I'm sorry, the end of verse number two, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. She seems to recognize Jehovah God and says, Blessed be thou of the Lord. But yet she is practicing something that is completely um, in violation to God's word. So here we have a recognition of God, right? But we have a complete violation of what God's word says. And uh, unfortunately, we're living in a day and age where we see a lot of this happening. Um, they are recognizing or attempting to worship the Lord. And, and, and we see churches this morning, we'll meet all over the country, that are in the name of, of the God of the Bible, getting together, together to worship, but yet they're in direct violation of, uh, of what God says in his word. Uh, and this is exactly what they're doing. Now, the situation gets worse. So we have a mother sort of setting the standard for how their home is. We can see that, right? She, she claims to be a believer in God, or she at least, at least made this statement, you know, my son blessed um, be thou uh, of the Lord. Um, but then when it comes down to it, she's, she's creating images. Um, the Bible says about these images um, that they were in the house of Micah. So her son Micah now has these images and he, they're set up in his house and they're part of uh, his home there. Verse number five tells us, And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So there's much more than just this little shrine in the corner of the house. He's going to create a full-blown, some of the wording of this is very interesting, but he's going to create a full-blown worship system in this. Right? Micah creates a worship system which includes uh, a house of gods or idols. Um, uh, the Bible says in verse number 5, and the man Micah had a house of gods. Right, It includes an ephod. By the way, this would be something that would be, you know, an ephod is part of the priestly um, Levitical system. They would wear an ephod as, as God instructed them in his law. 
Uh, and so he is taking some of what is right according to the, to, to the law of God and as he creates his own worship system here. Um, and a, a teraphim, a teraphim is just an idol, a small idol of some sort. Um, uh, and it would be some sort of a probably little statue that they would worship. And so he takes those things and um, and then the Bible says, and he consecrated one of his sons. So he takes one of his sons and sets him apart and, and, and probably goes through some kind of a witch ritual. <laughs> ritual would probably be accurate as well. Some kind of a ritual to say this son is, is set apart for the service of being a priest. Now, this is interesting, right? He wants to set up this, this system in his home of, of worshiping God that would include, you know, his house of all these gods that he has and the ephod for part of the worship and these teraphims. And now he has set up even his own son as a priest until, and we're going to see in a moment, until he gets like an actual Levite for a priest. Then he just throws his son to the side. Um, and it, it, incredible, interesting how this, how this all takes place. But so here he, he's setting up this system and, and he's got the house of God, this gods and, the, and an ephod and a teraphim. He sets up his son right, uh, and as priests, how can these things all happen? How does this happen the way it does? Verse number six, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And that's exactly why this is being set up in his home, because he's doing that which is right in his own eyes. He's not following the word of God. And as he does that which is right in his own eyes, right, he's coming to these poor conclusions, all in the name of the God of the Bible, um, all in the name of Jehovah God. So verse 6 explains how all this happens. Because every man did that which was right in his own eyes. All right, now, verse number 7. Meanwhile, so we have Micah right, doing all this stuff. Meanwhile, verse number 7. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. And he sojourned there. So here we have a young man. He's a Levite. Now, what do we know about the Levites? Right, the Levites were the tribe of Israel, that would take care of the priestly responsibilities. That's what they did. Um, uh, and so all the tribes had their responsibilities and what they would do as far as the children of Israel were concerned. And the Levites were the ones who would take care of all of the priestly responsibilities. They would set up the tabernacle. They would be the ones who would give the sacrifices for the people. They would be the ones that would um, take the tabernacle as they were going through the wilderness and they would uh, wrap the tabernacle up and move it to the next place as God directed them through a pillar of fire by night or a pillar of cloud by day. And so here we have an actual Levite, right? And he's so journeying, he's on some kind of a journey. And verse number eight, and the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. So here we have an actual Levite, right? He's journeying, he's, he's, on a, he's going to sojourn and, and, and travel, um, uh, and he's looking for a place to, to sojourn or to stay. Um, uh, and uh, on, uh, on his journeys, he happens to come to Ephraim, to the house of Micah. Verse number nine, And Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. I'm going to look for a place where I can live. And Micah says, wow, what an opportunity. I just set up this whole system of worshiping God, and now i got a real Levite here, someone who is actually a, a, uh, uh, you know, assigned by God to be in the priestly tribe. i got someone I can really use as part of my, my new system of worship. Um, verse number 10, and Micah said unto him, dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Be unto me a father and a priest. Now, as we go through this over the next few chapters, we're going to see something that looks an awful lot like organized religion we see today. And not only is he saying, I want this guy to be a priest unto me, I want this guy to be a father unto me. Now, some of the wording of this in the Bible, um, uh, to, to me, is very telling of what happens when you set up your own religious system not according to the word of God. Here he has a man who's going to call him father. He's going to put him in the position of being a priest. Very interesting, in, in my opinion, very interesting about what's going on here. And so Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and a suit of apparel, and, and thy vittles. So the Levite went in. See, so this is a great deal. Um, all right, I can, I can do some priestly things, and um, I've got a position of respect, and, and now they're going to pay me to do this, and give me some 
um, take care of my vittle, take care of my daily needs, um, and give me something to wear as part of this, this priestly system he's going to set up. And, and then I get paid to boot. By the way, what happened to the son? <laughs> oh, I'm just casting you aside right now. I got a real priest here. Uh, and, and obviously Micah's concern is not, con is not lined up with what God would have with any of this um, as he began to set up his own system here. And so, verse number 11, And Levi was content to dwell with the man, and the young man uh, was unto him as um, one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. All right? Uh, so meanwhile, there was a Levite from Bethlehem, Judah, who was traveling and looking for a place to sojourn. He comes to Mount Ephraim and the house of Micah. The Levite became a father and a priest for Micah, as Micah set up this system here. Um, and then very interesting, and I want you to notice this now, verse number 13, the very last verse of the chapter. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. Micah said, I've got a real Levite here. And by the way, in his mind, he's putting this all together. Here I have set up my gods, my idols. Here I have an ephod now, and I'm, I'm ready to worship God. And, and by the way, he's trying to worship Jehovah God. Um, if you notice in verse number 13, uh, now know I that the Lord, capital L, right? This is the Lord God he's trying to claim will do me good. And he set this all up, and, and now he's, he figured, well, my son might be fine for a, a priest. But, but then all of a sudden, God supplied him a real Levite he could use as a priest. And he's thinking to himself, boy, this whole thing is just of God. God sent somebody to be a priest in my new system of worship here, and I've got the real deal. So now, he said, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. I've got a real Levite. God has sent this man, and I know God's going to do, uh, do me good now. And so clearly, as we are reading this, um, they are very misguided throughout all of this and very off base from what is happening. But Micah really believed that he was putting together a system that would be pleasing to the Lord God. Why is it that he thinks this is all going to be okay when they're clearly in violation of God's word? Right? They, he, he was willing to set up a priest that had nothing to do with the Levites and, and, and in so many ways had nothing to do with what's right as far as what God meant for a priest to do. Um, uh, uh, but yet here, here we have in violation to so many things that, that God would have them to do, and they're in direct violation to God's word, but yet he thinks he's doing something that will bring God's blessing on him, and now know I that the Lord will do me good. God's going to bless this and do good through this. And so he had sincere intentions, but was way off base, way off base with what is right and what is wrong as far as what he has set up here. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning with the brief time that we had Okay, the, the main reason this all happened is found in verse number 6, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so here he is deciding how he's going to worship God and the way he's going to worship God, how he's going to set up his worship for the Lord, um, having nothing to do with Scripture or nothing to do with God's law and everything to do with what he is setting up. And so he was, uh, he was not directed by God's word. Now, the day and age in which we live, we are inundated. It is, it is all over. Christian people, believers, right, who are sincere, but they're not being directed by God's word. And they are worshiping the Lord on their terms and in their way, and they are not following God's word and how they serve the Lord and how they worship the Lord, how they love the Lord. And I'm not just talking about, although this does include, right, these big mega churches that have a completely worldly philosophy and they have a big rock band and and it's clearly it's just of the of the world as they try to draw people in through their worldly methods and God clearly tells us to be separate from this world I'm not just talking about that although it does include that I'm talking about believers on a day-to-day -day basis who are worshiping the Lord and following God on their terms I will serve you know, in an area where I think I'm comfortable serving, but don't ever ask me to do anything that I th is going to violate what I really want to do. Um, I'm going to give all, God all that I have up to a certain point, as long as it's within my comfort zone, that I'm going to serve God um, within the area that I think it's okay, but I'm, I don't, don't ever ask me to do anything beyond that. 
Um, and I'm not going to be directed by God's word. Rather, I'm going to be directed by, and you can fill in the blank with anything else other than God's word. And when we are not directed by God's word, we see some bad results. Okay, several things here. When not directed by God's word, okay, honesty is not a first priority. Integrity is not a first priority. Um, we see here in verse number two what happened here right from the get-go. We see right off the bat, we see something that is something that is clearly wrong. I mean, you read that and you think something's not right here. Um, right off the bat, you see Micah took um, these 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. Uh, and, and he stole them. Now, he gives them back to her. <laughs> But clearly there's, there's a problem with integrity here. Pro clearly there's a problem with the relationship um, that they have between a mother and a son. Um, and, a, a, and as a result of this problem, um, you see a foundation. We see a foundation that is certainly hurt in, in this life of Micah, raised growing up in the family that he was in. All right? And when you're not directing, okay, when you're not being uh, uh, directed by God's word, integrity is not there like it ought to be. It's not a priority. Honesty is not a priority. The very foundation is crumbling. And uh, we begin to have this anything can go mentality, and we are dictated by our conscience of what, and our idea of what right and wrong is, but yet the foundation is weak because it's not the word of God. And eventually it's going to fall apart. We'll find ourselves doing things and saying things uh, that, that aren't lined up with word, the word of God. All right, We have to have our beliefs and what we do based upon and directed by God's word. When we don't do that, we have a, a weak foundation. The honesty and, and integrity is not a first priority. Being right before God is not a first priority. But what's the good test for that? Right, I'm going to do right because... If I don't, and the pastor's going to know about it, or so-and-so is going to see that I'm not doing right, uh, and I don't want them to know that, and so I'm going to do right because I don't want them to catch me doing wrong. Okay, if nobody saw you do what you do that was wrong, if nobody could caught up with you on that, um, would you still do right because God is watching? And we have to answer to the Lord. By the way, <laughs> you've got to answer to God someday for your actions. And answering to God is a lot more scary thing than having to answer to me. In fact, I'm kind of a nice guy. <laughs> I'm not one to really come down hard on judgment. I, I tend to show a lot of mercy, right? Um, uh, but someday you're going to have to stand before the Lord with your actions. And now for the believer, it's going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, and there's going to be a great loss there. And we're going to be embarrassed for what we should have done. We talked about this a little bit last night at the, um, at the adult Bible study. Um, as far as, you know, um, when all tears shall be wiped away as we're standing there in the new heaven and the new Jerusalem are coming down, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And, and uh, why would there be tears wiped away? Probably, possibly because of uh, uh, a shame that we have, because we could, didn't serve the Lord like we should have when we were here on this earth. By the way, we are capable of doing that. It doesn't have to be a time of shame. Um, God didn't design us to fail and never be able to please him. Right? God designed us so that we can do his will and that we can please him. And he can say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Um, and so, uh, uh, but those kind of things, serving the Lord and keeping God first, are not a priority um, when we're not following God's word. And we find ourselves with a very shaky foundation. Uh, number two, when um, not directed by God's word, number two, um, your service to the Lord is misguided. Verses number three and four, we see what she does with this silver. And when she had restored the eleven, uh, and when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, um, his mother said, "I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord." Isn't that interesting? I dedicated the silver unto the Lord, Jehovah God, from my hand for my son to make a graven image, and a molten image. Now therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Um, yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took the two hundred shekels or took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. So she said, okay, um, uh, uh, I have this silver, um, but uh, because she's not being directed by God's word, she has sincere intentions. She wants to serve the Lord, but it's all very misguided. You cannot worship the Lord however you want. Now let me repeat that statement. You cannot worship the Lord however you want. That is a wrong, you cannot do that. 
Now, that's important in the day and age in which we live. It's early, and we're, you know, it's a, we're kind of zoning out a little bit, but listen, this is important. You cannot worship the Lord any way you want. As I stand in the foyer way, and I, I, I you know, several months, well, maybe even a year, over a year ago, I stood in the foyer way, and, and uh, a young lady um, didn't make it to the church, didn't make it to the church the week before, because she went and visited somebody, and, and so as she is talking to that individual in the foyer way of the church, and she said, boy, last week, we didn't make it to church, but I was over at your house, and we, we talked about the Lord together, and she said, I told him, you know what, we're having church right here, just the two of us. No, you're not having church right there. That is not the Bible definition of what church is, and you cannot just come to your own conclusions based upon what you think might be right. It has to be lined up with the Word of God, and the Word of God is very, you know, the Word of God has regulations and rules for what a New Testament church is. When you were sitting with one other person at their home on a Sunday morning having coffee with them, you were not having church. You may have had prayer together, and were two or three together. The Lord is amongst them, in the midst of them, and maybe the Lord was there, but you certainly weren't having church according to what the Bible definition of what a New Testament local church is. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the thing that happens, right? People tell me, oh, I just feel, I don't know about church, I just feel close to God when I'm out on the fishing boat, you know, and, and fishing and out in nature and and, uh, and that's fine. You can go fishing and you can feel close to God. I'm not against that. But don't think you're having church on a Sunday morning doing that. Um, we have to have things according to the Word of God. And there's a whole, obviously, a whole plethora of things that we could get into. But that being said, you cannot just worship the Lord however you want. Just because it feels right or seems right does not make it right. You, uh, you must be lined up with the Word of God. Oh, it just feels so right. It just seems so right. I had years and years ago, I had a, a lady say to me, um, uh, uh, she was talking about the church she went to, and they were speaking in tongues, and, and uh, she was just part of the service there, and she, she was overwhelmed, and she spoke in tongues, and, and she said to me, how could that be wrong? It just seems so right. It, I could just feel the Lord's presence as I spoke in tongues there in that church service, and what she described to me did not line up at all with the Word of God. Even if, even if someone were to say, all right, I, I speak tongues in a very biblical way and were to lay out how they spoke in tongues in a, in a biblical guideline, right? She wasn't doing that at all. Um, even if, because tongues is in the Bible and there are regulations of tongues. I happen to believe that the gift of tongues is not for today anymore for very good reasons out of scripture. But even if you weren't to believe that, not believe that, and you said tongues were still for today, a lot of what you're seeing is not lined up with what Paul said need, tongues needed to be. Uh, and, and you can't just violate scripture and say, oh, I just feel like God was in that. I could just feel God in your emotional rush, right? We cannot just worship God however we want. We have to know the word of God. Okay, your service to the Lord will be misguided when you are not directed by the word of God. Any misguided decisions, all right, um, uh, are permissible. Any misguided decisions you make become permissible. They become part of it's okay. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, you're not allowing God to direct, God's word to direct you, and then those misguided decisions you make become acceptable, and then any old misguided decision you make becomes acceptable in worship, because you're not allowing God's word to dictate. I just make one uh, of my sons a priest, he said in verse number five. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I, got these, I got this house of God, and I have an ephod and a teraphim, and, and I'm going to concentrate one of my sons who became his priest. So I'll just make him a priest. And, and that's okay, because it doesn't matter which direction we go, or which, uh, as long as we, it feels good, because we're not using God's word to dictate anyways, so we can just do whatever we want. Uh, and by the way, when a real legitimate priest comes by, we say to ourselves, forget you, I'm done with you now. Um, this guy seems to be the real deal. Um, he just goes any direction. Why? Because he's not guided by God's word. And we have to be careful about this, right? We want to make sure our lives are guided by the word of God. We can't just go any direction we want. Um, uh, number four, when we're not directed by God's word, number four, we are quick to turn any event into God's blessing. Verses number seven through 13, he finds this priest this Levite, I should say. And he says, wow, you're, you're like the real deal. I'm going to make you the priest of my house. I'm going to pay you, and I'm going to make sure you got the right garments. I'm going to take care of you, and you can now become the priest in this, this worship system that I set up. Uh, and, we, and he said to himself, boy, the Lord is just blessed. Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have the Levite to my priest. 
And we can just turn about just about any situation and to say, boy, that's just the Lord blessing when we're not guided by God's word. I just see God. I just see the Lord's hand in it as, as everything coming together. Uh, but yet I'm not giving you any scripture for why I believe that or why I think that. Um, uh, and how many people have, and I could tell you crazy stories, right? How many people who have felt as if God is just leading and guiding in their lives um, through circumstances or through situations or through strange things that happen to them, and none of it is based on the Word of God. Now, can God use situations in our lives? Absolutely, He could. I'm not going to say He doesn't. I'm not going to say your testimony isn't genuine. Um, but if you've never one time read your Bible in the last five years or whatever, and you've never sought God out from his word on direction, and then you tell me God comes to you with some kind of vision or whatever, uh, you know, we need to have God's word as the basis and guidance for our lives. If we don't, we'll find ourselves misguided, just as misguided as Micah was here and his mother. Uh, and so the biggest problem they had here was every man did that which was right in his own eyes as they were not following God's law and God's word. And we find ourselves doing the same, coming to poor conclusions, coming to wrong ideas, when we're not guided by God's word. There's a lesson this morning, right? Get to know God's word. Make your decisions based, based upon the Bible. Not how you feel, not what seems right, but what is right according to the Bible, according to God's word. I just have a word of prayer. Yes, Cecilia. Right, and that's exactly what I was referring to. There's, I do believe that tongues are not for today, and I have very specific reasons for that. But if someone even were to take the stand that tongues is for today, most of them are not following the biblical guidelines. That was for that time. They have to have an interpreter, exactly. It's always a language of some sort, a specific language. It's not just, you know, they claim it's just angels' language or something. Sometimes I don't know what they... You know, you can actually watch some of that. I don't recommend it, but you can actually watch some of these things on YouTube. And it's weird. <laughs> it's strange. Uh, so, anyways, but... All right, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get ready for our morning service. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to know your word and to allow it to guide our lives. Um, thank you for the book of Judges, Lord, and the examples to us of what happens when we do that, which is right in our own eyes, and we rely on ourselves. And Lord, help us to love you. Help us to <clears throat> understand um, what you would have for us. Be with the service today, Lord. May we...